Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Well, welcome back. And I have two Johns. <laughs> it's, my, my, it's the my morning with two Johns. My favorite right. partner, John Coleman, and our favorite gourmet of virtually everything, John Mariani. <laughs> How are you, John? I'm very well, thank you. It is a beautiful. No, he was talking to me. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> John, it's good to see you. And uh, uh, I, I wanted to have you share something that I read in your newsletter, The mm -hmm. Virtual Gourmet, mm -hmm. which is available at johnmariani.com. To everyone, <laughs> free. free of charge. If I um, and as you know, I'm a regular subscriber. I love your writing. Uh, and I love the mix that you do in the newsletter of uh, travel and food and uh, you've got the regular New York corner which I love and the regular uh, Las Vegas corner with John Curtis which I love anyway and, and, that's and, what I and his to fascinating share. book Love and Pizza <laughs> and the book a serialized yeah, really. book yeah, Charles Dickens has got nothing on you let me tell you <laughs> but he wrote by the word oh <laughs> <laughs> you're writing by the newsletter yeah right so here's the article that I read, which I thought it, it really we should share with our Celebrating Act Two friends, is uh, good reasons why not to uh, age your wines. And I always thought that at least red wines needed to be aged. Uh, so anyway, I love the article. Share with us the good reasons why uh, you should not age wine. Well, let us go back in history. Let, 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 me, let me do this, too. This is what uh, William F. Buckley always used to do. But <laughs> uh, Where's, the pad? Where, to, where's uh, the pad? Where's the pad? <laughs> if you go back to the dawn of wine history, um, the stuff was always drunk fresh. When, once they found out that uh, you just press some grapes and it ferments into this great stuff that has alcohol in it, Wow, that was really good. But they didn't have any aging facilities at all. So they used to put them into clay pots, which were called amphoras. And um, the trouble with wine is that if the alcohol doesn't kill off all of the bacteria in the wine, you're going to have bad wine very quickly. But fortunately, the alcohol generally does that. Okay, so fast forward to the introduction of oak barrels, or barrels of any kind of wood, um, but those are invented simply to transport wines, not to age them. What they found is that if you had to transport them from Persia to Egypt, they still tasted pretty good when they got there. So the whole idea of aging wines in oak uh, goes back to transport, not to uh, tasting uh, the, the wines after one year, two years, three years, four years. So that's a rather new phenomenon when uh, they started in... The Renaissance and the French kings and people with enormous cellars would start to age their wines. And they found out that the better ones, better red wines specifically, and a very, very few of the white wines, um, tasted better because they acquired some flavors from the barrel. And they even used to, they would char the barrel to give it a little more caramelization. And something like Chardonnay, which is a very bland um, white wine on its own, took on the character of the winemaker. So um, there was good reason to age the wines, but not for years and years and years and years. That, that was this fallacy of um, or connoisseurship which the British invented. And they actually liked wines which were <clears throat> rather oxidized, uh, slightly oxidized. They liked that taste. Today, that's a complete flaw. They also found out that if you add alcohol to wine that comes from a hot climate like Sicily and put it on a boat to England, like Madeira and Marsala, Madeira is from Portugal, and Marsala and uh, other wines, that uh, that would stabilize the wine, also ups the alcohol. Um, so once you open a bottle of Madeira or Marsala or a fortified wine port, it's not going to get any better at all. And if you keep it around for 20 years, it's also not going to get any better at all. Okay. So that's for fortified wine. For regular wines, 99% of, of the wine produced in the world, whether it's California or Australia or South Africa, is made by the producers to be drunk as soon as you get it to the um, 
they can get it on the shelves and get it off the shelves as soon as possible so they can make a profit. Um, the capital investment in years and years of, of wines is truly expensive. So after two, three, four years of aging a wine properly in perfect cellars in France or California or Italy, they want that wine out of there. Now, are there wines that age that get better with many years of age? Yes, but don't take a chance on it because unless you have the perfect conditions and the perfect vintage and wines that are known historically to age very, very well, all bets are off, even with those. I had recently um, broke out for a celebratory a Cheval Blanc 1971. Now, Cheval Blanc is one of the greatest wines out of Bordeaux and is known to be <clears throat> take years and years of age. Well, I didn't even have to sip it. I, I could sniff it. It smelled like rot. Okay, Down the drain it went. So there's no guarantee of this uh, in, in any way. So that, that's kind of the main reason. And also there's no get your money back. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not entirely, well, huh. you couldn't bring the wine back years later. That's, that's for sure. But if you did buy a wine, and let's say you bought a Cheval Blanc, that the <clears throat> wine store had kept for 10 years, and that's bad. Yes, you can bring that back. I would not drink the whole thing and then bring back the bottle. I would bring back <laughs> the rest of the wine to have them taste. You know, John, I, what I find fascinating is the the mix of myth and reality. And, and I love the way you address uh, both of them uh, in that article and, and sharing it with us today. That's great stuff. Um, do you... How often do you do a wine article in um, in the virtual gourmet? It seems like you do it every week. Every week, I have a couple of others. I have one specifically, other wine writer who about once every three weeks. Uh, Jeff Kalish, who is a very fine writer and, and an MD who believes in the benefits of wine to your health, he um, he writes for me also. But yes, every week, and I try to mix it up with um, wine interviews, with profiles of uh, wine makers. We'll be doing one soon. Um, about Francis Ford Coppola, who makes much, much more money from wine than he ever made from his movies. Is uh, that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, his uh, initially, his movies funded his tiny little winery. Now his great big winery <laughs> funds his movies. So there's that. And so there's profiles, there's interviews, there's book reviews. There are articles <clears throat> uh, on wine tasting notes, which are my least favorite, because it's very difficult to rate uh, well, I never, I don't get numerical ratings, which are preposterous anyway. Um, but I hate describing things as tasting of a cigar box of bell peppers <laughs> picked on the vine in the sun in the Napa Valley and all um, that sort of nonsense is just nothing but nonsense. So if uh, uh, the original article you uh, wrote, which is far more extensive uh, than what you've relayed to us today, uh, what the, where, where can I find it? And that particular one, uh, uh, can you give us the year of archive, or should we make them search through it? Uh, that was just uh, that was just published about two weeks ago. Oh. So yeah, and you can look in my archives that are there. Um, I, I should say I want to say a couple of things about aging. Um, first of all, champagne. Again, the British like champagne that has a slight onion skin flavor to it. The French don't particularly like that, but the French do produce vintage champagnes. Um, most 99% of all champagne and sparkling wine are, do not have a vintage date on them at all. Okay, they're 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 made. They're kept in in the cellars in, in champagne country for a while. Vintage <laughs> champagnes uh, only occur once every few years. Although increasingly they occur a whole lot more because the winemakers are better and because they want to sell the stuff. So you might go to the store right now and see a vintage champagne from. 2015, 2016, that has been held back to acquire more flavor. But I would not advise you to stick that in your cellar for another five to 10 years and think that it's going to taste any fresher, certainly not going to taste any fresher. Um, the other thing is that people who have very old vintages in their cellars can have them <clears throat> by the winery of certain stores, they will re-top it off with fresh wine because they realize that corks rot, that there is oxidation, 
And you can lose a little bit of the wine, which is called the oolage, which is the, um, the uh, space between the cork and the actual wine. So you can have that done at a, at a cost and they will kind of refresh your wine. But, you know, we're not getting any younger. And if you were 25 years old and started building your wine cellar, well, fine. But I hope you drink it by the time you're 35 because those wines are not going to be any better. And as the great Errol Flynn said, well, to paraphrase him, he said, anybody who dies with more than 10,000 bucks in the bank didn't live his, live his life right. So I say anybody who dies with more than 20 bottles of wine in your cellar didn't live your life right. I have a quick, <laughs> I have a quick associated uh, question. I think it's associated. Um, uh, bottles come in, uh, uh, they're generally the bottles or glass. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I don't say that uh, facetiously, they're generally glass. And then they are a color, they're a dark color. Uh, how did that all come about? Is that is that significant on the aging process, or that have something to, something else? Uh, some other it's, a, it's a it's a putative um, protection against sunlight. Oh, okay. Basically. But since these things are in cellars anyway, it's just not a real concern. For all I know, green glass was at one time cheaper than clear glass, which is entirely possible, but I don't know. John, great stuff. Uh, we'll look forward to more great articles on wine, including the article on uh, Francis Ford Coppola. And where will we look for that? Gourmet. Where will we look for that? At the Virtual Gourmet, which is available going to johnmariani.com. And it's free, free, free. It's great, free. great Not writing. And, 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 a, and it ages well because you have these amazing archives that always remain fresh. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun to go back and read the archives, too. Anyway, John, thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.